The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tony D'Angelo's PM Coast to Coast. Now, here's your host, Tony D'Angelo. And a very good afternoon to you wherever you happen to be. I am your host, Tony D'Angelo, of this edition of Tony D'Angelo's PM Coast to Coast. And as you know, I like to bring in different guests of various endeavors and disciplines. And I came across this lovely lady, Diane J. Finley, a long career as a theatrical performer. And I know Diane and I are going to have a lot in common. Um, I kind of approach it from a different way. Uh, My dad and uh, a couple of my uncles and several of my cousins all work behind the scenes in Broadway, and uh, uh, a lot of my client base has been Broadway-based. So uh, I'm well familiar with, uh, quote-unquote, what is known as the gig economy long before it became the gig economy. (laughs) Seems like I've been doing it for uh, longer than I care to think about, probably more years than uh, a lot of my listeners are old, but uh, I um, we're going to have a whole lot of fun talking to Diane, I know, and there's, she has an incredible resume. I mean, things here, you have to do it in small print if you're her. There's just so many things that she's performed in, and she really has exhibited great talent and versatility through the years, so I can't wait to get started with this, so why don't we get started with it? And I'd like you to sit back, as Tom Snyder would say, fire up a color fina, and we're going to have a good old time. When you have a good time, you got to listen to music like this. The Dramatics, 1971. What you see is what you get. And if you're not seeing what you want, you got to be getting somewhere else on this show. Let me tell you, we're right back after this. Program number four. The Turnstiles clicked a merry tune at Milwaukee's County Stadium on an August evening in 1961. The standing room only throng of 40,775 was the biggest stadium crowd in two years. Reserved seats had been sold out for weeks, and the fans lined up hours before the game at the bleacher entrances. The Braves were far off the National League pennant face and their rivals, the Chicago Cubs, were deep in the second division. But that didn't matter. Fans came from the city, the suburbs, Chicago, and even further. They came to see a pitcher bid for a victory that would put him in a charmed circle. Lefty Jack Curtis was a Cub starter. He was only three years old when his pitching rival started his pro baseball career. But that didn't make the Milwaukee pitcher's job any easier. For four innings, the two southpaws racked up zeros on the scoreboard. The Braves pushed one run across in the fifth, and the Cubs matched that tally in the sixth. In the eighth inning, County Stadium came alive, and Gino Simone walked a home run to give the Braves the lead. A hush fell over the crowd as the pitcher walked to the mound to start the ninth inning. He was only three outs away from victory. Andre Rogers was the first batter, and he was erased on four pitches. Only two outs to go. Jerry Kendall was the next, and he lashed a low liner to center. But Cino Simoli raced in and made a great sliding catch for the second out. Ernie Banks was in the bat rack for the Cubs. He had been benched for a couple of days, but was sent up as a pinch hitter. Banks grounded one hard to third, but a bad throw by Eddie Matthews gave Ernie a life. Another pinch hitter, Jim McEnany, stepped to the plate. He looked at a couple of balls and then sent a fly to right field. Hank Aaron moved over a couple of steps and pulled it in. I'll finish the story in 60 seconds. One of the things uh, on that Bob Feller broadcast that I'd like for you all to know, that is actually 57 years old today. That was Bob Feller's radio recap of August 11th, 1961. Ain't that wild? You know something strange? Here are four very important letters. You take an I, you take an E, you take an R, and you take an S, and you unscramble them, and it comes out rise. They're the folks who actually invented 
Air raid is shaving. Men, no matter what kind of skin or beard you have, you can get a smoother, more comfortable shave. Because Rise, the original push-button shave, now brings you three new instant lathers. Rise is super wetted, whisker wilting, the finest lather ever made. Puts more moisture into whiskers, soaks them soft down to the base. Then Rise's self-rising lather makes your whiskers stand up straight so your razor cuts them off at the skin line, smoothly, comfortably. So choose the Rise that's right for you. Rise extra cool with menthol, cool, breezy, skin bracing. Rise extra heavy with lanolin, great for men with heavy beards. Rise regular with extra soaking action. All three give you smoothest shaves in half the time. You know something strange here? Ladies and gentlemen, up and down the stations of the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, I am so pleased today to be joined by Diane J. Finley, an actress, performer, singer with a long history in Broadway, in television, in film, and recordings. And I uh, mentioned, uh, first of all, good morning, Diane. How are you today? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. And yourself? I am fine. Thank you for asking. You know, very few people ask these days. It's like, you know, they, they just assume I'm okay. And, you know, I keep going to the world and saying, please don't treat me as a, you know, dangling partisan. <laughs> it's like, I completely understand. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I had an, an artist friend years ago. God bless him. He recently passed on. He lived about 100 years. John McCrillis. He was a uh, noted artist in the New Haven area. And people would always come to him. I'm sure you get this too as a performer. And they would be like, could you paint this picture for me? Or could you do this piece of art I want for my, my dining room, my living room, whatever the case may be. And one day he turned to me and he said, you know, I just can't do this anymore because excellence is assumed every single time and I'm a human being I don't know when the day's going to come when I'm not going to do something excellent and he turned and I said but John you always do things excellently he says yeah I know but it gets to be kind of a drag after a while well when the stakes are that high it's very difficult to achieve constantly yeah yeah for certain but uh I, I, I'm so fascinated reading your, your resume. Now, you said you grew up in Suffern, New York. Yes, I did, Suffern, New York. And, and somehow I have this impression, which I know is not accurate, but this is how my mind plays, of Marlo Thomas playing Anne Marie and that girl. I, she was from Brewster, I think, and she would take the train down and go to auditions and things. Was that you? <laughs> no, but I sure wish it had been. <laughs> So, wh when did you get bitten by the theater bug? Well, you know, I think I came out that way. I uh, went to, uh, oh dear, memory lane, Miss June Caston's dance school in Suffern, New York, when I was four years old. My first performance was at the Lafayette Theater, which still is there with the original um, uh, organ. And uh, I've always been dancing and singing, and I came into New York when I was, well, let's see, always did high school uh, musicals, and then came in at 18 years old and started working professionally, so it's something I just simply always wanted. Now, when you moved from Suffern to the city, were you in, I, I don't even know if they exist anymore, there were these hotels for young ladies who were in the city where people would kind of keep an eye on them and make sure they wouldn't yes. get into trouble? Well, yes, I was. In fact, I was. I stayed at one of the last of the really good ones. It was called the Rehearsal Club. Yes, Denise Pence, our friend, mentioned that. Yes, Denise. Uh, that was uh, started in, I think, 1913, and it was. It became world-renowned after, after Kaufman's play. And um, the, it, it was a wonderful experience. I stayed there for two years. We were well taken care of. We were safe. My parents were happy. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
<laughs> well, you know, and it wasn't a time when, like, you could go somewhere. Like, if I go in and around New Haven, it amazes me. I, it seems like I don't get out much anymore, but you see these um, Asian students from Yale who will go to the Noodle House. And they'll get on their phones, they'll sit at a table, and they'll be conversing with their folks in, you know, Sapporo or Tokyo and li- li- like they're next door. But it was like, uh, you know, you had to kind of wait for a payphone, I guess. Oh, it was fun. I used to get so much trouble. I'd have paper and pencils ready, and I would forget which agent wanted me to do what. Oh, dear. He's always mad at me. <laughs> in those telephone booths where there was no room for, sit- for sitting down and writing what you have to remember. That's absolutely unbelievable. So tell me, like, you know... I about s- that the other day walking down the street. You know, I miss everything that was. I, I, I just think that everything has gotten cold. It's gotten cold. All this computer, nobody talks to each other. I lived in the best of times. Yeah, you know, and, and you're you're so right to mention that, and it's like when you, what, one of the things I, I get very fascinated with is, uh, you know, quote unquote, in those rare moments when I have nothing to do, you go to YouTube, uh, and you, you bring up these films of like New York in the 1950s, yeah. and Los Angeles in the 1960s, and we just have these lost cities that like nobody knows about. I know. That's it's, very true. But talking about YouTube, YouTube is my best friend. Yeah, uh, for for certain, and, and it has been for a lot of us. In every conceivable way, I also do a lot of homework on YouTube for myself if I need to learn dialects. It's a, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful site. It it really is. It's a wonderful tool. Now, when you um, when you were in New York City, was there like any one role or any one uh, engagement or any one appearance that you kind of consider to be a breakout for you? Yes, Hello Dolly. Ah. I was in the original company of Hello Dolly. I was the, of course, I was a baby back then, but I was the first replacement. Wow, and that first replacement for Carol Channing? No, no, I was only 18 years old. Oh, I, you know. <laughs> well, I wish, I wish. <laughs> Uh, no, I was the first replacement in the chorus. I was thrilled to death. So I worked with Carol Channing. I worked with Ginger Rogers. Uh, I worked with all of them. Well, you know, I think, um, I don't know if, if I, I shared it all over, but the most critical person uh, in, in this exchange, if you will, which happens to be you. I don't know if um, if I shared it with you, but my Dad and my several of my uncles and several of my cousins were involved on Broadway, you know, the stage side. My dad uh, did the lighting and sound for Broadway shows, and my uncle was a props guy. And, uh, no, you didn't tell me that. Yeah, actually, my uncle Tony, uh, whom I was named after, was the stage manager uh, at the Schubert Theater, which, which brings me to another part of my life, because for... Uh, 30-something years in, in my professional life, we've been uh, we've had their, uh, a relationship with the Schubert Foundation. So it's like, it, it, it's amazing. The, the theater has been very good to me, Diane. <laughs> yeah, I guess it has. I'm so happy, so happy to hear that. But, uh, yeah, and, and they, they are like, you know, beyond a world-class organization over there. It really is something. They, they, they know how to do theater, and, you know, but for them there wouldn't be theater. Oh, uh, I say they've been doing it for a long time. A long time, yeah, and, and at a high degree of professionalism. Yeah. But the... Um, so as far as like quote unquote, and this is I want to get your impressions before I tell you mine. Uh, we were actually when I was doing the lead-in, we were talking about you know today it's real cool you know the gig economy. We all want to be doing gigs, you know we don't want to be employed. And like it dawned on me, it's I've been doing the gig economy for thirty years for crying out loud. It's like okay, where's tomorrow's meal coming from? Tell us what that's like in show business. You know, as a young lady, as a performer, and you know maybe uh, going on through. Your your career? Well, it can be a little difficult. You know, people always ask me when I'm going to retire, and I always say I'm an actor. I've always been retired. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you know, Tony, I've been very
very lucky. I have a very good agent, Karen Garber. She's been wonderful for me. She's a good businesswoman. She takes care of me. And I have, although I have never been a star up in life, I have truly been and still continue to be, thank God, a working actress. And I have worked and continue to work all over the world. And I have been able to broaden it to nightclubs, to doing plays. Uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, I did Fish in the Dark with Larry David. And that's an interesting play. Tell us about that. Well, it's a direct takeoff on Seinfeld. And it's, uh, I, I was doing uh, some, it, it involves a bereavement in the family? Yes, exactly. And it's all around that. How, how, how do we get mother not to have to live with her son? <laughs> you know, his comedy is great, and people absolutely adored the play and adored Larry David. Now, um, you had uh, done a, uh, I, I guess, um, was it um, a later production of The Producers uh, that uh, you had appeared in? I did the movie. Yes. I did the last movie. Uh, yes, I did. I was one of the old ladies. <laughs> I was telling somebody uh, this week in my office suite, um, I still think of that Zero Mistel role where he's romancing the uh, oh, the okay. older women okay. coming in, okay. and, and, and uh, one of them is forgetful, and she forgets to bring the check, and she says, until next time, he, and he says, you want time, you got to bring Jackie, no Jackie, no time. He. I said, I can relate to that very much. I know. Still, my favorite one. That that's the best of all of them. It, it's it's really it, it's just such a, a an amazing production. But um, now, as far as um, you know, I I, I can I, I know what it's like as far as going back and forth. My dad worked on a show. I believe it was. I can get it for you wholesale if I've got oh, that. Cool. And and that was the one where a very young Barbara Streisand, if I recall. That's uh, right. What was the understudy, and, and and later got a role, and he would come right. home and like uh, you know, he'd be right. home late at night. I'd wait up for him, and then the the next day he'd say, "There is a Jewish girl, man, she could really sing. I hope she gets a break." <laughs> I remember seeing uh, Barbara Streisand down at a club called the Bon Soir. Wow. Many many years ago, when she was a nobody, and I recall saying, "I've never heard a voice like that in my life." Yeah, and it's funny, like my father would talk about her and Elliot Gould and what nice kids they were. I was really hoping that they'd make a, you know, make a dent in this entertainment world. And I'll tell you, you, you never know. No, you don't know. You don't know. You know, I've noticed that you've done a lot of regional theater. And uh, one thing that caught my eye was uh, this play uh, known as I Loved Lucy at the Laguna Playhouse? Yes, it was written by Lee Cannon, who was Lucia Ball's cousin. And it was his take and his memoirs and memories of, I think, the last five or ten years that he spent with Lucy when she was not well. That was a wonderful play and also was Laguna Beach. I enjoy working in Lort theaters. I... Uh, I find they have wonderful directors and wonderful ethics, and it's a nice way of traveling around the country and working for two months here, two months there. It's, it's, it's always been good. Um, we had hoped to bring it into New York. That didn't happen, but it still might. It's I know Lee did get a big round of great reviews. He did go to London, but they used an entire London company, and it was a huge success in London wish that I could have gone. Understand now, get, let's talk about two things. Getting into a character, um, I've spoken to actors in the past and several actors and performers have told me that when they're, when they're read up, when they're ready to go, when they're ready to identify with whatever character that they're performing, they actually forget their name is Diane Finley, but their name is Lucille Ball. Is, is that the kind of experience that you have? Yeah, you have to do that. You have to start layering. 
I mean, if something is so completely, now Lucia Ball is not that different from me, uh, so it wasn't that hard. However, I wanted her mannerisms. So I bought out, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 of her uh, TV series, which mm-hmm. was a wonderful lesson, and I watched them religiously until her mannerisms sort of formed inside my body. I looked at a lot of clips. I went to Lincoln Center, looked at old clips with her hairdo, how she smiled. So, yeah, you do a lot of homework. I recently did a play called Marjorie Prime, and it's about uh, Lois Smith did it on Broadway and then did also start in the movie. And I worked at the public theater up in Maine doing the leading role. And that was hard for me because... I don't know how that feels. So I spoke to a lot of doctors. I watched a lot of movies, did a lot of YouTubing, and uh, slowly layered the character during rehearsals. But once that, once, once she came to be a part of my body, it was a, it was an amazing experience. But it took a while. Uh, That's y- the fun of it. That's the creative part of it. You know, and and the thing that, like, we don't realize, I mean, I think that we all realize that if we want to be successful in something, uh, maybe not all of us realize it these days, but I think, uh, you know, right-thinking individuals realize that if you want to be successful in something, you've got to, you know, use a very unpopular word, um, sacrifice. You've got to sacrifice a lot of things to, to, to do a certain thing well. And, you know, you, uh, you, you count the cost of that and w- what it's like and what you will have versus what you won't have. And, you know, and, and we go through these exercises, you know, pretty much through our whole lives. But that said, um, one of the things I, I my, my dear actor friend Michael Dante uh, is, um, you know, from my hometown. We've been friends for years. And the thing he told me is, it's like if you look at his credited um, appearances on the uh, Internet Movie Database, uh, there's maybe a a gap of a year or two years, whatever the case may be. And I asked him, I said, what were you doing during that time? He said, well, I was going to acting school every day looking to get better. When I needed money, I would take a loan on the house. And when it came time for the, the payday to come in, I paid the loan back. This is, this is how he lived. Uh, well, let's see. What have I done? Uh, both, both. I would go to class. I would go to coaching. And I went to work for S.D. Lauder. There was, there, was, there was a period of about a year and a half before everything took off again. And I worked for S.D. Lauder. I was the assistant spa manager at their spa that they used to have at Bloomingdale. No kidding. It's scary out there in the real world. <laughs> yeah, I know. Everybody's looking for a safe space. It's like uh, it's like I had a millennial come to me the other day and saying, you know, I go to my safe space. I said, can you show me where that is? <laughs> I'd like to know, too. <laughs> can I follow you there? No, wait a minute. You may not feel safe if, if uh, you know, if, if, if that's the case. It, you're absolutely positively... I have a wonderful apartment that I moved into, oh, brother, 19... 19- 75 on the Upper West Side, and it's one of those charming pied de terres that I can't let go of because I'm still rent stabilized. Oh, oh, that, that that's a wonderful thing. It's a gift, an absolute gift. And uh, as far as um, I, I guess you are one of these New York City people, even though you may not, as you were saying earlier, you may not be entirely happy with. Uh, you know the, the the shape of things these days. It's uh, you probably couldn't see yourself anywhere else. I would imagine. No, I love it here. I, I love the energy, the pace, the people. I, I'm not a country girl. Uh, I, oh, I, I I suppose if I had a country home on weekends, that would be the ideal way to live. But no, I've been here since 18. I couldn't wait to get here. Yeah, I then and, 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 and happy here again. You see, my apartment is my safe place, and it has truly been my home. I've done a great deal and still do a great deal of entertaining. A lot of people have crossed the threshold here. It's a wonderful place to be. Now, giving as much as you have to your craft over the years, 
Um, I'm not going to ask the dumb question, which is, did you have to make sacrifices in your personal life? But what I am going to ask is, what types of sacrifices did you have to make in your personal life in order to do your craft well? I really forgive the silence. I had to think about it. Uh, uh Or maybe, you know, I, maybe it was a joy to you and you didn't consider that you were missing anything. Well, I never, I think that's exactly what I'm trying to say. I don't, did I make sacrifices? I, I mean, I'm sure we all make sacrifices every day for something that you don't even think about. Um, no, I, again, as I said, I was very straight about what I wanted from the day I was born and I went after it. Um, no. I live a happy life. Boy, that that's that that is great. You know, as far as um, it has been up and down because then you think I was a crazy person. <laughs> of course, there's been a lot of tough, tough times, but uh, um, I think that's part of life. Hey, I'm healthy. I'm healthy of mind and healthy of body. That's a good thing. Well, and and not only that, but you've made many, many people happy through the years. And the thing is. Um, when one goes to an event, when one goes to a play, a game, or whatever the case may be, the whole idea, at least for me, has been, can I leave my personal, professional, um, social cares away from my brain for a couple of hours and, and take in watching the best do their craft? And I mean, it, it's a blessing for, for all of us to watch you guys get out there and just to, uh, you know, uh, keep us away from our problems for a couple of hours. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that's funny. I was on tour with Sister Act for about a year and a half, and that second half of the year was really getting to me. It was a lot of traveling on our days off. I was exhausted. It was time to leave. And that's exactly what I would do. I'd sit down with my half a cup or my full cup, and I would say to myself, now, wait a minute. You get to make 2,000 people a night times eight laugh. Get over it. You're a lucky girl. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing. I've made people laugh all over the world. And you know what? When you make people laugh, you laugh yourself. Well, you're absolutely right, you know, and that's that's really... And, and what I liked about your emails, you would always say to me, uh, you know, uh, with laughter... And it's like, and, and I had a, I mean, we, we've all had weeks recently, but uh, when I saw that, it's like, yeah, you're right, it's time to laugh a little bit. Yeah, it sure is. It's the and, greatest medicine in the world. Yeah, for, for certain, yeah. It's a merry heart makes like a medicine. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, before you called, I've been sitting here memorizing a script. I am going off to uh, a theater in Long Island for a month to do the musical Flash Dance. And are you there? Oh, I'm here. I'm listening. And then in between that, I'm doing a show at 54 Below with uh, Elaine May, uh, Carol Lawrence, Jim Brochu, a myriad of people. It's the musical Ballroom's 50th anniversary. And Billy Goldenberg, who wrote the show, music, and the Bergmans, who also wrote the music, will be there. And we're going to be having a night of songs that were taken out of ballroom and songs that were in ballroom. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a great night. Now, you, you when you had mentioned that, you left me on the corner uh, like the house on the road gone by when I heard Carol Lawrence. This is the Carol Lawrence? Yes. Wow. I did name with Carol at Helen Hayes. Wow. I was madly in love with her as a boy. Oh, sure. All you guys were. <laughs> yeah, I did name with her. I was Vera. She was Maine. My father would always say, you got to marry somebody like that because real, her real name is like Lauren Zano. She's a nice Italian girl. <laughs> That's right. So am I a nice Italian girl. <laughs> Man, oh man! I, you know, one role I wanted to talk to you here about. Um, you played the role of Maxine, which was the Ava Gardner role on Night of the Iguana. And tell me what you did to get ready for that, because Ava Gardner, who is this goddess of film, playing that role, it's like, 
uh, you really got to respect for her acting talent because that was so non Ava Gardner. I know, I know. Um, uh, again, you know what, Tony? That's almost too long ago for me to remember. Ah. All I remember is watching the movie and thinking about what I would have in common with what she did and what I read on the page. More than that, I don't remember. Too long ago. I listen. That's uh, <laughs> I, I. I could relate to that well, especially these days. Was there a favorite role that you did that you, you think about? That was me, and that was everything. You know, the best I can do, and you know, that was my signature performance. Or do you adopt the thing that my signature performance is the next one I do? No, I think it has to do with the size of the role. But what I, I would imagine that right now my signature role would be the full Monty, Jeanette. In the full Monty. Ah, now, now tell us about I, that. Beg your pardon? Tell us about that. Oh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful, silly role. She's a piano player, smokes too much, drinks too much, and has a big mouth. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> now, um. Now, I also, let me just say, sure. Uh, my favorite composer to this day is Jerry Herman. Mm -hmm. And I have done every one of the leads in his shows at least two or three times. And I also adore Sondheim, who I've also done many, many shows of. Boy, that's a, that, that is wonderful. Um, is there, um, how, how could I say this? Um, in the shoulda, coulda, woulda category, is there a role that you... Yes. Oh, yes, I have two. Mama Rose and Cabaret. I never got to do either one, and I don't know why. Hmm. You know, Beauties of the Eyes of the Beholder, and uh, I've auditioned for those, and uh, I, 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 I don't even think I've got callbacks. So there must be an element that I show as I walk into a room that they don't see in that role. Isn't that interesting? And I'm too old. Now I could probably do... I don't know. I, I, you know, I... If you're not sitting at that table, you don't know what they say. Yeah, no, it's it, it's absolutely, uh, you wonder, and then many times I'll watch a film, and I'll say, ah, oh, so-and-so would have been so great in that role. Why did they pick so-and-so? Yeah, well, there's that. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, Michael Dante always tells me the roles that uh, he wished he had, but the problem was he was too tall. And the leading men were shorter, and they didn't want to be in a scene with somebody taller than them because of that. Yeah, you know, it can be the simplest and the, the, the most reasons you cannot overcome. You can't overcome. You can't overcome them. You better, no. Now, in, in our closing moments together, um, the art form of the theater, the art form of performance, do you, as one with grease paint in your, your veins and your arteries, do you have a concern about preserving this art form for generations to come? Well, we were talking about that the other night at a dinner party, and we were saying that we think the real biggies, like the Carousels and the Oklahomas and the South Pacifics and the My Fair Ladies, will probably always live. You know, they're always being remounted. Um, let me say this. I hope not. Uh, a lot of theater that I see today, uh, it sure is different. It sure is different. But what I will tell you is I don't know where these kids are being trained, but uh, I've never heard so many magnificent voices in my life. Of course, it's a whole different technique now. It's all that high screaming belt, which is something in my generation we didn't do. Um, I think that it's a whole other way of interpretation. Um, it sounds more like recording sounds. Interesting. Not my favorite, but, you know, you have to go with it and enjoy it and uh, try to understand it. I liked our form. I, I just preferred our form, but uh, what can I tell you? Well, you know, and, and my, <coughs> excuse me, my, my belief is, and I believe I was discussing this with Denise or perhaps with Denise and, and several others, that the theater and performing, I think, is a wonderful way for both, you know, young boys and girls 
to get out, to learn discipline, to learn timing, to learn not to be shy, to learn how to perform in, in front of a group of people. And I, um, you know, and, and to me, um, the, um, the theater performers, particularly the women, uh, have a, a wonderful and tangible quality of, I, I just can't describe it, of, of, of balance, of togetherness, of coordination that uh, I, uh, you know, I, and I think a lot of that just comes from the discipline of the theater and performing. I totally agree with you. The discipline is unbelievable. Well, it's funny. I'm going to mention a name to you. You probably know her. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't, but I think it's a 50-50 chance. If I mention the name Bambi Lynn, would that ring a bell for you? Bambi Lynn? Oh, my gosh, are you going back? Well, well, let me tell you how far back I go. My father, and again, I think this was, uh, I don't know if it was Irma LaDuce or um, I can get it for you wholesale. One of those two plays, she had a role. And uh, we were living in Stanford, Connecticut. And it was a snowy Sunday, and it was like, is is the play going to perform? So my father had called down to the uh, the theater. I, I don't remember, Diane, what theater it was. Uh, and they said, yeah, you know, the roads are clear and the highways are clear. We're going to, you know, go ahead and get it started. My father said, okay, great. My mother said, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried. Can I come with you? And he said, yeah, let's go and uh, let's take, I, I was known as Anthony then. Let's take Anthony. It'll be fun. So the phone hangs up, and this is before the days of call waiting and all that, and it rings again. And my mother picks up the phone. And it's a lady on the other end of the phone. And uh, the lady says, uh, hi, is Larry there? And my mother's like, why do you want Larry? He's my husband. He says, oh, this is Bambi Lynn from the show. Says, oh, okay, I, I will get him. And uh, Bambi, I guess, lived over in Old Greenwich and asked my father if uh, you know, the trains were down and if she could catch a ride. Uh, and he said, oh, sure, you know, I'll pick you up. So uh, the three of us, I guess, kind of slip slid in a Chevy Bel Air to Old Greenwich. And in the car, Diane, I'm, I'm a little kid, walks this lovely, poised, intelligent, attractive, drop-dead gorgeous lady, polite as all, who made the biggest fuss over me. And I'll tell you, I saw it then as a child. It's like there's something different about this type of person. You know, and, and, and that has stayed with openness. me. It's the openness that most people don't have. Tell me more about that. Well, I know, I know I'm know, i that way. I've gotten in trouble with that at times, but I don't care. Um, I'm, I'm wide open because I have to work with emotions so much. I'm not afraid of them. So it's not unusual for me to walk down the street thinking I'm the mayor of the Upper West Side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I talk to everybody. My greatest joy, and I'm really serious about this, is when I'm out to see how many people I can make smile and laugh. I just, just absolutely love to do that. You're not afraid. As an actor, you're just not afraid. Now, I have met very shy actors, which is always fascinating to me. I've been to parties where some of the biggest and the best sit in a corner because they're just shy and yet are just the opposite on stage. So, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's really something. I remember when I worked at um, 200 Park Avenue, uh, which was then known as the Pan Am Building. It still is the yes. Pan Am Building in my heart. And I would go to the Barnes & Noble uh, over on 42nd Street, and he'd run into some celebrity people, uh, a very a, a, a younger... Um, uh, very, very polite and, uh, you know, engaging uh, Rudy Giuliani working as a lawyer. We would talk. I, you know, but not the Rudy Giuliani of today. This is the premier Rudy Giuliani. And, uh, you know, he, he would always, and we'd chat about books and things. And there was an actor. And uh, the actor uh, is a very famous actor. And, Diane, you hit it right in the head. This guy would hide behind bookshelves so that once he was recognized, so you would go away from him. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, yeah. I can't explain that. I, I, I don't know what that is. It's just per personality. Yeah, I... Uh, <laughs> I was also raised in a big Italian family 
where everybody sang, everybody played an instrument, and we partied 24 hours a day. So I came from people of joy. Yeah, it's it, it's really it it, it 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 really is something when when you're around that and, and and everything works, you're you're very happy with it, and that, that's that's absolutely true. I, I had a yeah I, when I was at the Yankee game, I guess it was last week. I had a friend years back who did carpentry work uh, for his uncle's um, construction company in the Bronx, and one day they were doing carpentry work for uh, at the home of Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft. And, and and my friend was a naturally funny kid. He really could have gone somewhere as a comedian if he really had that confidence. Anyway, Mel thought he was great. Mel was laughing. And Mel's brain's about to click in. Hey, have you considered? Or, gee, you know, maybe we'll take you to an improv or something. Down the stairs comes Ann Bancroft. And sort of like... What are you doing, Mel? Well, I'm talking to this very funny kid, and and Anne kind of gave you that impression of uh, I've got the you know Academy Awards and a couple of nominations, and you don't, and we don't talk to the help. <laughs> oh, real, totally different people. Yeah, and you know they had a very happy marriage. You just go figure. But it's like a yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I think that's what made it happy. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure. I mean, there nothing succeeds like success. Uh, anyway, um, we in, in, in winding out, um, you will would you kindly restate uh, as you did earlier where you will be performing so our friends and fans can follow you along and where they can follow you along when um, as as you go in and out of different performances, Diane. Lovely. Hi everyone. I'm starting the musical Flash Dance out at Gateway in Belport, Long Island. We perform from August 29th through September 14th. On September 4th, I will be at 54 Below uh, doing a show on the 50th anniversary of Ballroom with a roster of wonderful, wonderful performers. So please come on out and say hello. I would love to see you all. And we'd love to see you. Listen, thanks so much for sharing with us all these merry minutes and um, you can uh, get back to uh, your real hard work of preparing for your roles. And thank you for being so kind to be with us today. Thanks, Tony. You were a dream to talk to. Have a great day. Thank you, Diane. Bye, dear. Bye-bye. different major leaguers in color. So start your day a little bit better with post cereals and start collecting your free baseball trading cards today. One of the charitable missions of the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network is to go into your closets and your bookshelves and get those books that are collecting dust 
and donate them to Project Head Start or any place where <clears throat> excuse me for a second where kids can read literacy is a major issue remember knowledge is power and if we don't read we don't know if we don't know we can't help ourselves if we can't help ourselves you know the rest of that equation so make sure you donate books and reading material to those who otherwise would not have the means of buying them or making an effort to get to do them it is so important people we need to read today we need to be informed so we'll be right back to you right after this As you know, I like to do the Dan Ingram word of the day, as Dan Ingram did many years ago on WABC Radio in New York. And today's word of the day is triskaidekaphobia, and that actually is fear of a triple-decker bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Anyway... have a lot of people here to thank. Having an issue here with the sound, we have a lot of people here to thank. We have to thank, first of all, the dramatics, Bob Feller, Nat King Cole, <coughs> having an issue with my throat, Rise Shave Cream, Post Cereal, Mickey Mantle, and our dear guest of the afternoon, Diane Finley. Anyway, be sure to come back and join us for what will be another edition of Comfortably Zone Radio this coming Saturday. It's been a whole lot of fun, technical glitches notwithstanding, but as they say, it's coming to you absolutely live. So you guys take care, have a wonderful week, and we'll be catching up with you real soon. As Dan Ingram would say, Kuska Day, and we will see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs>